Open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. The title of my talk tonight for this last night of our series is called It's Time to Take a Stand. This is, as I mentioned, this is a three-part series. Uh, the first one was called Sanctuary Secrets, and the whole series I'm calling Sanctuary Secrets. But that was part one last night. This morning was part two on the final atonement. And part three is right now called the Time to Take a Stand. And our opening text is Revelation chapter 11 and the 19th verse. So let's, uh, let's pray again and ask for God's blessing as we get into the final grand finale of this special weekend, the last weekend of 2019. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is such a blessing to be here, to be in this, uh, this building with so many of your people as we have been looking at your word, thinking about the return of Jesus Christ, we want to be ready, we want our, our families to be ready, we want to be healthy, we want to be spiritually healthy, we want to walk with Jesus, and in these last days, Lord, you know that we need to take a stand, a stand for God and a stand for truth. And Lord, we pray for your blessing upon this final meeting of this weekend. Please send the Holy Spirit here. Help me as I open my lips. May your words flow through me is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Last night... We talked about the sanctuary, and one of the verses that we looked at was Revelation eleven nineteen. I remember one time I shared this with somebody over lunch, uh, and as we were talking, he, this person was so impressed, and, and he just said, the ark, the ark, I just can't get the ark out of my mind. Revelation 11:19 says the temple of God was opened in heaven. There is a temple up there. Jesus is up there. He's our high priest up there in heaven's temple. And then the Bible says there was seen, and I mentioned last night that many times in the book of Revelation, John will say things like, I saw or I heard or I was told to write this down. Or I fell down at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But in this verse, he doesn't say, I saw. He says, there was seen. And that little word, seen, reveals that there's more than one person that sees this. There's a group of people. And those are people on earth who, by faith, they read their Bibles. And they, by faith, look up into heaven. And by faith... They see the ark. They know that it's up there. There was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And as we talked about last night, uh, if you want a Bible verse on this, it's Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 1 to 5. It's very clear that the main article of furniture that was put inside the ark was the the tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, written with the finger of God. What makes the Ten Commandments different than any other law that's ever been developed or penned throughout all history? That's right. What makes this law different is it was written with the finger of God. There is no other law that's ever been written with the finger of God. And not only that, but this law is written, was written on stone on rock. Now, what do you think the Lord was trying to say to the human family by taking his own finger and writing his law on, on a rock? 
Yeah, it's permanent. It's, it's, you can't change it. Have you ever heard the expression, we can change this or that because it's not written in stone? Well, this is where it comes from. God's law, written on stone, still exists today. It has not been nailed to the cross. It was the sacrifices and the ceremonial law that was nailed to the cross, not the Ten Commandments. You can never get rid of the Ten Commandments. In fact, the reason why Jesus died is because people have broken the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is the law that shows us what sin is. We know what sin is because of the Ten Commandments. And when we look at them one by one, the Holy Spirit brings conviction. Conviction of sin. And when you're convicted of sin, then who do you need? You need Jesus. That's right. You need a Savior. That's right. And Revelation says that when the Ark of the Testament is seen, and the word testament actually means covenant. The Ten Commandments was God's covenant that he wants to make with people. Now, there's an old covenant and there's a new covenant. Uh, the old covenant, when you study this in the Bible, was ratified with the blood of animals. The new covenant was ratified with whose blood? The blood of Jesus Christ, that's right. In the old covenant, the Ten Commandments were written on stone. In the new covenant, the Ten Commandments are written where? In the human heart, that's right. So stone and animal blood versus the blood of Jesus and the law being written in the, in the heart. And it's the same law. The law doesn't change, but its location changes inside of your heart and the path to forgiveness changes through the blood of Jesus Christ. But it's the same law, and as you read the book of Revelation, the secrets of the sanctuary is that the law of God is still there. It has not been nailed to the cross. It's very much intact, it's very much in force, and there's gonna be a whole group of people who see it in the temple of God in heaven. And then it says, there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great hail. A lot of fireworks. Like on Mount Sinai, there was a lot of fireworks. God gave fireworks when he gave his law on Mount Sinai, and he put fireworks into Revelation eleven nineteen to impress people with the importance of his law, which is inside the ark which is inside the most holy place. Now, in the very next chapter is Revelation chapter 12. Right after chapter 11, the last verse we read, let's go to chapter 12 and look at the last verse. You would think that if a group of people see the ark by faith in the heavenly temple, what are they going to start doing on earth? They're going to start keeping that law. And chapter 12, verse 17, talks about the war that we are in. And it's an intense war. Verse 12 says that the dragon, representing the devil, was, King James says, wroth. My Bible, which is a King James Easy Reader Bible, if you've ever heard of that one. Uh, you can get this from Whitehorse Media. We actually sell these. It's a, key, it's a real King James Bible, but it has a few of the words uh, updated into modern language. But it is a real King James Bible, and I, I love this Bible. So my Bible says, the dragon was angry with the woman. Some Bibles say furious. Okay, wrath is what the King James says. It basically means wrathful, angry, mad, furious, upset. And he's angry with the woman, which is God's church, 
and he went to make war with what group of people? He went to make war with the remnant. And my King James Easy Reader Bible uses the word remnant. That's the right word. The remnant is the final group at the end of time who see the ark, who understand what Jesus is doing in the most holy place, who understand his, his cleansing work by his blood and his work to write the law in the heart. They understand that. They're the remnant of her seed, and it says, which keep the commandments of God, and they have the testimony of of Jesus Christ. So here's a final group of people, a people that the devil is making war on, people who are commandment keepers and who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They hold on to his testimony. They believe in him. They trust in him with all their hearts. And these are the people that are at the center of the storm. Generally speaking, the, in the Christian world, there's a lot of faith and belief in Jesus, but there's not a lot of talking about the Ten Commandments. Not much. And the remnant in Revelation 12, 17, they bring them both together. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus. Now, if you turn to chapter 14 and look at verse 12, you see this people again at the conclusion of the third angel's message. Revelation 14, verse 12, says, Here is the patience of the saints. And the word patience means endurance. Because uh, it's not easy to take a stand. It's not easy to go against the devil. It's not easy to be different from the rest of the world. We need some endurance. And the, the scripture says here is the patience or the endurance they hold on of the saints, the saints of God. Here are they that do what? They keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. So they've got the law of God, and who else do they have? They have Jesus right now in the, you know, if you look at history, it's significant that in the, there's a pendulum, I like to call it, that keeps swinging back and forth. In the time of Jesus, the pendulum swung over on the side of the law, and the Pharisees said, we have Moses, you know, we follow the law. But then they looked at Jesus and said, who are you? What do you say of yourself? And they, they didn't believe in him. So they held on to the commandments of God, at least they thought they did, but they, they rejected Jesus Christ. At least many of them did. Now today, the pendulum has swung over to the other side. If you look at the, the Christian world at large, there's a lot of talk about Jesus, but not a lot of talk about the commandments of God. Pendulum swings between the commandments and Jesus. The commandments and Jesus. If you look at the history of our own church, uh, in the early days when the early Adventists went through the disappointment, discovered that the sanctuary was not the earth, but it was in heaven, and they discovered that there's a most holy place, and there's an ark up there, and then they studied the ark, and they looked by faith underneath the mercy seat, and they saw the Ten Commandments, and they realized that the law of God is still there. And then they went down one, two, three, commandment number four, and they discovered the Sabbath. That's how it happened. And then this group of Adventists in the 1830s and 1840s became Seventh-day Adventists. That's how it happened, based right on the Bible. But what happened in our history was that the Seventh-day Adventists in the 1850s and 60s and 70s and early 80s, the, the pendulum swung over. And they focused a lot on the ark and on the law, but who did they leave out many times? They left out Jesus. That's right, and uh, 
the little lady who speaks so often in books like The Great Controversy to those of us that live today, she said, concerning the, the church at that time, she said, we have preached the law, the law, the law, until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa. <laughs> have you heard that statement? So even the Adventists, like the Pharisees, overemphasized the law and neglected Jesus. And the pendulum just keeps going back and forth, back and forth. I wrote a, a little book, what's well, actually not so little, and we have it over at our table. Uh, if you're watching this and you're interested, you can get it on the website of whitehorsemedia.com. And the book is called God's Last Message, Christ Our Righteousness. And it's a book that studies uh, our history and looks at what happened in the year 1888. And what happened in that year was two men came from what state? Anybody know? They came from California. Some good things can come out of California sometime. I actually grew up in California, but I left in 2009 to move to Idaho, and I read a, a report in the newspaper that they took a census of how many people left California in the year uh, 2000 and I think it was either 2008 or 2009. I think we actually left in 2008, and then we bought our house in 2009. Uh, 2008, how many people do you think left in the, in the same year that we left? You'll never guess. You'll never guess. It's in the Bible. <laughs> 144,000 <laughs> left California in 2008. I read an article about that, and I thought, wow, I'm one of the 144,000. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Well, anyway... I got off on that. In the year 1888, there were two men that came from California, and they came to a big Adventist conference, and they preached. And they preached from the Bible, and they preached the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And what happened was the pendulum centered. And there was a little lady that was in the audience whose name was Ellen White, and she heard the preaching especially of, uh, of E.J. Wagner. It was Wagner and Jones, these two men. And she said, as she listened to Dr. Wagner speak, she said, I see the beauty of the truth in the presentation of the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law that the doctor, E.J. Wagner, has presented before us. And then she said, if our, if our ministering brethren would only accept the truth so clearly presented, the commandments of God and the righteousness of Christ together, she said their souls would be fed with meat in due season. Amen. So the, the beauty of the Advent movement, and it was at its best, at least according to that, the preaching in 1888 was that it combined the law of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ together and the pendulum centered. And I tell you, it was electrifying. It was electrifying. Uh, Ellen White said, this is the beginning of the light that's going to lighten the whole earth with its glory. And that's what we need today. We need to combine the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I like this. Uh, what is the, la the, the third angel's message is verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. Verse 12 is the conclusion of the third angel's message. And what is the last, what is the, where, what is the last word before the period at the end of the third angel's message? It's Jesus. That's right. And then in verse 14, Jesus comes. So the third angel's message is the last message for the world before Jesus comes. And the last word of the third angel's message before the period is Jesus. Jesus wants to have the last word in our lives. And the glory of the third angel is to bring the law of God and the faith of Jesus the gospel of Jesus Christ, together into one. It's electrifying when that happens. Now turn to the last chapter of the Bible. 
I know that a lot of people in the evangelical world, they really question whether the Ten Commandments still apply to us today. My response is, open your Bibles to Revelation 11:19 and take a look at the ark. The ark is still there. The law of God is still there. Then read Revelation 12, 17, that describes a final people, a remnant who keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus, and the devil is making war on them. He hates them because they are uh, defeating his delusions. And then Revelation 14, 12 talks about a final people who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus right before the second coming, which is in verse 14. And then when you go to the last chapter of the Bible, the very last chapter of the New Testament, right before it says this is the end, if anybody needs to be convinced about the reality of the Ten Commandments combined with the grace of Jesus Christ, they just need to read the last chapter of the Bible. Verse 14. Verse 14 says, blessed, this is the last time uh, the word blessed is used also in the Bible. This is the last chapter, and there's a final people who are blessed. Blessed are they that what? You know, I've got my King James Easy Reader Bible, and mine says, blessed are they that do his commandments. And some Bibles say, blessed are they that wash their robes. And it's true that we do need to wash our robes, but that's not what the text says in this verse. This verse talks about those who do his commandments. There's a blessing pronounced at the end of the Bible upon ten commandment keepers, that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter in through the gates into the city, which is the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem. Now, some people might say, well, how do we know this is talking about the Ten Commandments? Just look at the next verse. For outside, or with, the King James says without, the King James Easy Reader Bible says outside. And that's what without means. It means outside the city those who don't go in through the gates, those who don't get to eat from the tree of life. This is life or death. For outside, it says, are dogs, which is not talking about your pet, my pet, puka. This is talking about people that have no respect for the word of God. Jesus said, uh, don't throw your pearls before swine. It's not talking about literal pigs, it's talking about people people who have no respect for the word of God. For outside are dogs and sorcerers, those are people that are involved in the magic arts, and whoremongers, some Bibles say sexually immoral. Now, which commandment is that one talking about? Yes. Commandment number seven, that's right, that says do not commit adultery. Sexual immorality, and then it says and murderers. Now, which commandment is that? That's the sixth commandment. Do not murder. So here it's quoting from the Ten Commandments. And idolaters, which of the Ten Commandments is that? That is commandment number two, about not bowing down to idols. So we have the uh, Seventh Commandment referred to, the Sixth Commandment referred to, the Second Commandment referred to, and then whosoever loves and makes a what? Makes a lie. Now, which commandment says don't lie or don't bear false witness? That's number nine. That's right. So verse 14 says the blessing, the final blessing is on those who do the commandments. And verse 15 lists four of the ten commandments. And then the end of verse 15 talks about those who love and who make a lie. You know, and I've thought about that. When I first learned this message, I wrestled with this, and I thought, how do I know whether the Ten Commandments really apply to us today? You know, so many people say they don't. So many people say they were nailed to the cross. 
And, and they so strongly believe that. You can find websites online where they have whole articles and YouTube videos all about how the Ten Commandments don't need to be kept today. That was all for the Jews. That was all nailed to the cross. How do we know whether they're telling us the truth or whether they're telling us a lie? We can know by looking at the last chapter of the Bible. The last chapter of the Bible says the blessing is on those who do the commandments, who go into the city. And those who are breaking the commandments, they're outside with those that love and make a lie. I tell you, that, you know, that, when I read that, it settled it for me. <laughs> it settled it for me. Now I know where the truth is and where the lie is. It's a lie to say that the Ten Commandments don't apply to us today. Revelation 11, 19 shows us the ark. Revelation 12, 17 describes a remnant who keep the commandments. Revelation 14, 12 describes a final group of saints who keep the commandments and follow Jesus. Revelation 22, verse 14 says the blessing of God is on those who do his commandments. And then it says those who are, it says they will get to go into the new Jerusalem and those who are going to be shut out who are outside of the holy city at the end of time, those who are lost are those who are breaking the sixth commandment, the seventh commandment, the ninth commandment, the second commandment. It says they're among those who love and make a lie. Yeah. So as I've thought about the Big Ten and the battle that we're in right now that's going on on all sides of us, Where's the truth and where's the lie? The Bible says the truth is blessed are those that do his commandments. This law, to me, has become very, very important. I, I want to get inside that city. I want to be there. I don't want to be deceived by a lie and be... Uh, outside with the dogs and the sorcerers, right? I want to be inside with God's people. Now, lest you wonder whether this is really true, look at the next verse. Verse 16, who's talking about this? Who's talking about keeping the commandments and those who are outside the city are breaking the seventh and the sixth and the second and the ninth. Who is the one who's telling us this? Verse 16 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So some people say, I believe in Jesus. I don't need the Ten Commandments. And my response is, if you believe in Jesus, listen to what he says. Jesus points to the commandments. When we break the commandments, we realize that we're sinners, and the law points us to Jesus. Jesus points us to the law, and the law points us right back to Christ. If we preach the law, but don't lift up Jesus, then what are we doing? We're, we're damning people. We're dooming them. We're telling them, you're a sinner, you've broken the law, but there's no Savior. If we lift up Jesus, but neglect the law, then what are we doing? We're, we're, we're neglecting to help people to understand why Jesus died. He died because we broke the law. And if you take the law away from the gospel, you have no gospel. If you say Jesus died for our sins, but you have no idea what sin is, you have a watered-down gospel. But when you realize that the law shows us what sin is, and that's why Jesus died, 
then you're putting the law and the gospel together. Now, a little bit more in this chapter before we go back to Exodus. Verse 18 says, I testify to every man who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things, which means he who preaches and teaches and supports these things, says, surely I come quickly, amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. So right at the end of the Bible, it gives us a warning. It says, don't add and don't take away from anything that's in this book, right? And we just read in Revelation 11, 19, 12, 17, 14, 12, 22, 14, we've read in all these verses that the law of God is very much intact, right? That's what the prophecy of this book says. So if people uh, try to take away any of that or add to it and say, no, the law of God doesn't apply to us today, they are in great danger of having their, if, you, if they take away any part of this law, God says, I'm going to take your name out of the book of life. And they're in great danger of not going into the holy city and ending up with the dogs and the sorcerers and those who love, who love lies. Are you with me? Very, very solemn. We need to have all this settled in our minds. We need to know what this is saying. Now then the very last verse, somebody might say, sure sounds like legalism to me. And then my response is, read the last verse of the Bible. The very last verse says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So the Bible ends with grace. Grace, grace, marvelous grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The last chapter of the Bible lifts up the law of God, tells us that we're blessed if we do it, but it ends with the grace of Jesus Christ. That is the, the heart of the Bible. It's the heart of the book of Revelation. It's the heart of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. It was the heart of the 1888 message preached by Jones and Wagner. And it must be the heart of the final loud cry that we then go and take to the world, the loud cry of the third angel's message during the time of the mark of the beast as we are preparing people or the Holy Spirit is using us to prepare people for the return of Jesus Christ. We've got to have them together. How many eyes do you have in your head? You have two. How many hands do you have? Two. How many feet do you have? Right, if you're in a boat and you're trying to row, how many hands do you need to use? You need to use both. If you only use one hand as you're trying to row, you know what's going to happen? You're just going to go around in a circle. If you want to make progress, you've got to use both arms. And it's the same way with our Christian life. If we want to make progress and row against the current and head upstream toward the new Jerusalem, we need to combine the law of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have to go together. If you have the commandments without grace, all you're going to do is get discouraged. If you have grace without the commandments, then you don't know how to live. 
God is looking for people in these last days. He's developing people. He's developing a group of people in this world who are followers of Jesus Christ completely and who are willing to take a stand for the Ten Commandments which he wrote with his own finger on solid stone and which are right now up in the ark in heaven. And there was lightning, thunder, voices, an earthquake, and a great hail. As we go into the heart of the sanctuary, this is what we learn. This is the heart of the sanctuary message. Now, in the time that I've got left, I can see uh, 49 minutes on the clock. I want to have you turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 19, and then we're going to briefly go through chapter 20, and I'm going to take you through one by one the Ten Commandments. I'm going to make it real practical because this is what we need to take a stand for. Take a stand for Jesus and his law. And you know, the Ten Commandments really are not something separate from Christ, but they are really his character. It's a, it's a, the law of God is a transcript of the character of Jesus. God wrote down the details of his character on stone, and then that we, so we'd make no mistake, he came down and he lived the Ten Commandments in his life so we'd know what it looks like. The Ten Commandments is God's character written on stone, and the life of Jesus is the Ten Commandments lived in this world. They go right together. When God brought Israel out of Egypt and brought them to Mount Sinai, in verse 16, Exodus 19, 16, he gathered all the people at the foot of the mountain. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. And all the people that were in the camp, what did they do? They trembled. There needs to be some trembling today. There's too many people in this world that open their mouths and talk, 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 talk when they should be humbling themselves and listening. God gave us two ears, but only one mouth. I wonder why. I think it's because he wants us to listen twice as much as we talk. And he especially wants us to listen to his word. And he especially wants us to listen to his law. So many people today need to just stop talking. And they need to listen to the word of God. And there needs to be some trembling at the foot of the mountain as God gets ready to give us his law. Verse 17, Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. Now, it's not going to be long until we're going to meet God. You know, we're, we're down here in this world and God has, God has hidden himself because of sin. Because of sin, he has pulled back so that we won't be destroyed. And he's given us time in this world, in this sinful world, to get things right. So that when he comes and reveals himself, we won't be destroyed. That's why he's given us this time. And one of these days, time's going to run out. I mentioned this morning, and some of you weren't there, but last uh, Sabbath I was in a church, and they, I wasn't speaking, I was in the audience, and an elder got up and started giving announcements, and then all of a sudden the big clock that was on the back of the church that had been there Ever since I've been in that church, about 11 years, all of a sudden that clock came crashing down. It just fell down for some reason. And the elder had his wits about him, 
And he said, I think time has run out. And I thought, there's a perfect sermon illustration for me right there. One of these days, time is going to run out. And one of these days, we're going to meet God. And you know what? I've thought about this. To me, it is, abs- it is a form of insanity. It's a form of insanity to live your life without putting God first. When at the end of the journey, you're going to meet him. You cannot escape that reality. You may not believe in him. You may not want to pray and you may not want to talk to him and you may want to put him far out of your life. But one of these days, you are going to see him face to face. And there's no way around that. And so it's the, it's the, it's the height of insanity to not get ready for that day. And the, the wisest thing you can do is to get ready to meet with God. That's the wisest thing any of us can do. Moses brought them out of the camp to meet with God. Verse 18 says, Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. When you read the book of Revelation, that's what's going to happen to the whole world. In Revelation 16, there's an earthquake that's so mighty and so great that the whole planet shakes. And all the cities crumble. New York crumbles. Los Angeles, where I grew up, crumbles. Tokyo crumbles. Rome crumbles. All these cities around the world just collapse because the earthquake is so great. Nashville will collapse too, where I fly out of tomorrow. The whole world is going to crumble, and everybody's going to realize there is a God in heaven. There's a God in heaven. Verse 19 says, When the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder. The Bible says that when Jesus comes, he comes with a trumpet. Right? The trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised. We shall be changed. And those that are ready are on their way up. The trumpet will get louder and louder and louder and louder. People aren't going to be worried about the NFL on that day. They're not going to be thinking about going online and buying Christmas presents. They're not going to be going to the malls. They're not going to be watching television. They're not going to be thinking about all the things in this world that so often distract our minds. Not that we should, you know, never go to a mall. I'm not saying that. But there's so much that distracts our minds that we don't think about God. But when this day comes, nobody's going to be distracted. Everybody is going to be brought face to face with the reality of God. When the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with a voice. God spoke. He spoke. And we need to listen to the voice of God. We need to turn down the radio and turn up our spiritual discernment so we can hear the voice of God when he speaks to us in the Bible. So many things distract. I think, you know what I think the biggest danger is today? The biggest threat to God's church? It's not the Pope. Although I I don't believe that Pope Francis is being led by God. I believe that the Roman Catholic Church will play a major role in prophecy. But I also believe that the biggest danger to the church of God in these last days is not the Pope. It's entertainment. We have, you know, we have so much through our phones, we have access to so much entertainment and through the television and the internet. And and I'm not saying, you know, we should never take a break and watch anything. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, you know, we're so, we're so absorbed. You go into the, uh, into an airport and I've looked at people and, and almost, (laughs) almost everybody is looking at something. (laughs) Not everybody, but there's just so many. And I'm not saying, you know, I've got a smartphone too. I'm not saying we should never look at our phone and not use our phones. I have a Twitter account. We use Facebook. 
We use social media, but we use it for God. I tweet Bible verses. Not as many uh, people get my tweets as get President Trump's tweets or Pope Francis's tweets. <laughs> but some people get my tweets and they hear the word of the Lord. We should be using social media for God. We need to listen to God's voice. The Bible says God answered by a voice. Somebody wrote that when every other voice is hushed, we can hear more distinctly the voice of God. Now turn to chapter 20, Exodus 20. God spoke by a voice. Chapter 20, verse 1, says God spoke all these words. These are the words of God spoken by his own voice, and we do well to listen. We really do. Verse 2, I am the Lord your God. I'm your God. I've brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, he was talking to the Israelites, but he's talking to us too. And there's a message for us in this, that when God spoke the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai to the Israelites, the first thing he did was remind them that he had brought them out of bondage. And that tells us something. It tells us that God's plan for his people is not bondage. God wants us to be free. He doesn't want to bind your life and make your life miserable. God wants to free your life and make you into everything he wants you to be. God is a God of freedom, not a God of bondage. Now the devil turns that upside down and the devil says, if you, you know, when, when you're struggling, am I going to make a surrender of my life to God? Am I going to give my life to God? Am I going to fully give him everything? The devil whispers in our, in our mind, in our carnal mind, tells us, don't do that, because if you do, your life is going to be miserable. You're going to be ruined. All the good things you want to do, it's all out the window if you follow God. He'll bring you into bondage. Have you ever had those thoughts inside your head? You know where those thoughts come from? They come from the devil. That's what the devil thought. He thought, if I stay with God, I'm going to be in bondage. And he convinced a third of the angels to follow him. And you know where he ended up? He ended up in bondage. <laughs> He's the most miserable being in the universe, is the devil. He's going to be led away by the fit man, as I talked about this morning, and he's going to go out into the wilderness, and at the end of the thousand years, he's going to die. He's going to be burned up in the lake of fire. So much for freedom. Don't let the devil tell you that if you become a commandment keeper, your life is going to be in bondage. Because that's not true. Don't love and believe a lie. Believe the truth. God wants to free you. He loves you. He has a plan for you. He wants what's best for you. He cares for you. He loves you more than you'll know. And you'll never be really, fully, totally satisfied without God. That's the truth. That's the truth. And God starts out in Exodus 20 by saying, I brought you out of bondage. Now, another point is how, what was the final way that he brought them out of bondage? What was the, you know, he, play, he sent the plagues on Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Ten plagues fell one by one by one. And then the last plague is what was the very final thing that convinced Pharaoh to tell the Israelites, go, get out of here, leave Egypt. It was when his son died, right? The firstborn son, all, all throughout Egypt, they died. And, but the Israelites' firstborn sons, they did not die. And why was that? 
The reason was because, there was the, because God instructed them to put blood on their doors. Blood on the top, blood on the sides, the blood of a lamb. And when the angel of death went through Egypt, every home that had blood on it, the blood of a lamb, the angel of death passed over. And they were protected. And none of them died. So when God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, he was reminding them of the blood of the Lamb. Israel was born because of the blood of the Lamb as a free nation. And there's a message for us in this. Before God even gives his law, he gives us the gospel. Before he proclaimed his law on Mount Sinai, he reminded them of the gospel. Because that blood symbolized the blood of Jesus Christ. And that shows us that the one who gives us his law is the same one who sent his son to shed his blood. Right? And it's actually Jesus, too, that was on Mount Sinai. The one who gave us the law became a man and died for us. There's the law and the blood together. Do you see that? It's when we realize the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from sin that gives us a new life. It gives us forgiveness. It gives us freedom to begin to make progress keeping the law. We have to have grace or we can never keep the law. We have to have blood, the blood of the Lamb. We have to look at Jesus and accept Christ as our Savior or we'll never make progress in the Christian life. The law shows us our sins and points us to Christ and Jesus forgives our sins, washes us clean, saves us by his grace, shows us how much he loves us, and that love becomes the beginning of a new life where we begin to keep the law. Got it? I should hear a bigger amen than that. That's, you know, I, I guess you're subdued. That's fine. You're subdued. You're thinking. That's good. So, verse uh, 3. You shall have no other gods before me. God says, I need to be number one in your life. I want to be, I want no other gods, no cars, not money, not your spouse, not even your family members, your children, those that you love, your best friend, not even you. He wants no other gods before him. He wants to be number uno. You know what uno is in Espanol? It's one. God wants to be number one in your life. And that's what the first commandment says. I am the Lord thy God. I'm the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Number one. And I, I, I want to uh, appeal to you tonight on the last night of this weekend to take a stand. It's time to take a stand for Jesus Christ and to put God first above everything else. And if you do that, you'll never be sorry. It's the only way you'll ever be happy. Blessed are those who keep his commandments. And now if you're honest with yourself, you realize, boy, have I ever messed up in my life? Have we all sinned? Have we put other gods before God? We've all done that. But guess what? The law is like a mirror. I say it this way. The law is like a mirror that shows us our sin. And Jesus is like the soap. If you're dirty, you get in the shower and you use the soap. And you get clean. And when you realize you're a sinner that you've broken the commandment, you come to Jesus and you say, Lord, I'm sorry. 
And when you realize that you had to put, that the Old Testament, they had to put their hands on the top of the head of the lambs and confess their sins over it and take a knife and slit its throat, you realize that the lamb points forward to Jesus and that when you don't put God first, you're committing a sin, and that's the sin that put Jesus on the cross. Then you go, wow, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Forgive me and make me clean by your grace. And he'll do that because he loves you. You don't have to worry when, that he doesn't love you. You know, I went through a time when I thought, does the Lord really love me? Does he really love me? And the devil was telling me all over my head, he doesn't really love you. He loves others, but he doesn't love you. <laughs> he loves everybody else, but not you. You're too bad. You ever had that thought? And, and you know what I finally learned? I learned, don't follow my head. I can't listen to my head. I've got to listen to the Bible because the Bible is the voice of God. And the voice of God says, I love you. I paid the price for you. You're valuable to me. I know every hair on your head, even if you don't have any hair. I know every hair on your head. I know I've, I've made you and I love you. And I paid the price for you. A lot of times our minds lead us astray. You know, on the way over here, actually, when was it? It was on the way to the meeting this morning. That's it. I was following GPS from uh, the Hampton Inn in Pulaski. And I went down 64 and I kept on going and it said, you're almost at your destination. And then I got to a street, I think it was called William, William, D. Jones Road, and it said, GPS said, make a right on William D. Jones Road. And then I made a right, and I went just a little ways, and on the right was an apartment complex. And then the voice in GPS said, you have arrived at your destination. And I thought, this isn't my destination. This is not the church. I'm going to the church in Fayetteville to preach. And GPS was wrong, and, and as somebody was driving out of the apartment complex, right as I pulled over, I rolled down the window and I said, you know where the Seventh-day Adventist church is? And she said, oh yes, just, just follow me. <laughs> we'll go down the road a little bit more and it'll be on the right. And so I did that and I pulled into the parking lot of the church. And I thought about that afterwards and I thought GPS was wrong. It said, you have arrived at your destination. But I hadn't. And, and you know what? G GPS is like our minds. Our minds tell us to go here and there and believe this or that. So we'll get to our destination. But if we're not following this, you're not going to arrive at the destination you want to get to. Do you see what I'm saying? You'll arrive at the wrong destination. This is the path to, to lead us to the city of God. And the first commandment is no other gods before me. Now, I've got to go through this fast. I can see my time is moving. The second commandment, commandment number two, says you shall not make for yourself any graven image. It's talking about idols. And you can read the whole commandment, but the whole commandment is about bowing down and worshiping idols. God wants to be number one, and as part of him being number one, he doesn't want us to bow down to anything that's not him. That's why he forbids idolatry, because uh, it's worthless. It's, it's foolish for us to be bowing down to anything that's not God. Can we keep that commandment in this generation? Can we take a stand and not have idols in our lives? And there's many different kinds of idols, aren't there? People can be idols. Money can be idols. A car can be idols. A job can be an idol. You know, anything... Things that are, are, are normal can become idols if we're not careful. And if we're idolaters and we realize that and the Holy Spirit convicts us, then what do we do? Where do we go? 
you go to Jesus. Because you know what? Jesus paid for every idol you've ever, you've ever had in your life. He paid for every, every time you've had other gods, and he died on the cross for every idol you've ever had in your life. And forgiveness, full and free, is available to you, no matter what your GPS tells you. No matter what the devil says to you, don't believe it. The truth is the grace of Christ is available for you. Commandment number three says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Don't take God's name in vain. Don't just use the name of God or the name of Jesus. I, have, uh, I grew up in a Jewish home and I have Jewish relatives who use the name of Jesus a lot, but they don't believe in him. You get my point? But they, they say, oh, and they say, Jesus. One particular uh, relative of mine does that a lot. And sometimes I think, you know, I'll tell him, uh, he knows. He'll say, oh, Jesus. And I'll say, oh, he knows all about that. And he'll look at me like, what, what, oh, yeah, I just mentioned the name of the person that you worship. The name of God also refers to his character. God doesn't want us to say that we're Christians but live like the devil. He wants us to reflect the character of Christ in our lives. That's commandment number three. And if we've broken it, he says that the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain, which means we're guilty. But the good news is that Jesus took the guilt. He took the guilt on the cross. And he paid the price for every time we have taken God's name in vain. We all know the fourth commandment, don't we? Remember what? The Sabbath. the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Right, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. God's seventh day Sabbath is his holy day. I heard a, a speaker recently say that... Uh, in the church, he said, there's two groups. There's the sheep and the goats. There's the wise and the foolish virgins. And he said, you want to know how you can tell the difference? I've never heard this before. It was very profound. He said, the difference is because uh, the sheep are happy when the sun goes down Friday night. Because they, they look forward to the Sabbath. The goats are happier when the sun goes down Saturday night because they are very happy to get away from the Sabbath and to have it be Saturday night so they can do whatever they want to do. Yeah, mercy. I thought, wow, that's profound. God gave us the seventh-day Sabbath to be a blessing to us. He wants us to enjoy the Sabbath. He wants us to delight in the Sabbath. He's our maker, and he gave us that one day to spend time with him and he doesn't want us to hate the Sabbath, but to enjoy it because it's his day and we like being with him. See what I mean? And if we've broken the fourth commandment, which we've all done, then where do we go? We go to Jesus, that's right, because Jesus died for all Sabbath breaking. He died for all other gods, every idol, all taking the name of God in vain, and every violation of the Sabbath, he's already paid the price. And his blood is enough to cleanse your life, and his grace is enough to forgive your sins. It's enough. The fifth commandment, we should all know this. Some people say, what do they say? There will be a test at the end of the evening, well, there will be a test on Judgment Day. And the fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother. One day I read that and it really hit me. That was when my mom and my dad were still alive. My mother died a couple years ago and my dad died two Octobers ago. Now I don't have my parents anymore. It's very, very tough. I was very close to both my mom and my dad. And, and I thought about that one day, and it, the commandment says, honor your father and your mother. 
and I realize it's talking about my dad, Gene Wahlberg, and my mother, Sandra Wahlberg, and God wants me to honor them. I had a conversation with my son the other day, my 15-year-old, about how important the fifth commandment is. And in a Macy's, in a mall, he said, Dad, pray for me. <laughs> and, and we prayed, and he put his head on my shoulders right there in the middle of the mall, my 15-year-old, as, as I prayed for him, that God would help him. Honor your father and mother. Commandment number five. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. When you read Patriarchs and Prophets, the chapter called The Law Given to Israel, it goes down through the Ten Commandments one by one and illuminates each one of them. And when it talks about the fifth commandment, it says this not only applies to parents, but it, ap it applies to ministers and rulers and all to whom God has delegated authority. Read it in Patriarchs and Prophets, the chapter called The Law Given to Israel, that honoring your father and mother also talks about honoring and respecting ministers and all to whom God has given authority. Has God given authority to teachers? Has he given authority to people in government? Has he given authority to leaders in our church at the general conference? Uh-oh and the divisions and the union and the conferences. The Holy Spirit has convicted me. You read it in the spirit of prophecy. God has given authority to his church. And if we have no respect for the leadership of our church, then guess what commandment we are breaking? Commandment number five. Honor your father and your mother. You know one of the reasons why God made David a king was because he respected Saul. Even though Saul was trying to kill him, he would not harm the anointed of the Lord. And God blessed him for that. And he won the hearts of all Israel because he had respect for leadership. May the Holy Spirit convict us of that. And if we are convicted and if we've sinned and broken the fifth commandment, then where do we go? We go to Jesus and we kneel at the foot of the cross and we say, Lord, I'm sorry that my sin put you there. And I ask you to forgive me and cleanse my life. Commandment number six, you shall not murder. When you read about that in Patriarchs and Prophets, and the Bible also says that there's many ways that we can murder. And it's not just talking about, you know, shooting somebody. Of course, we shouldn't do that. But uh, the Bible says that if we hate our brother in our hearts, we're murderers. So if you hate anybody, you're a murderer. Just like the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. That's how to get on the devil's side, is to have hatred. And uh, it also says in Patriarchs and Prophets that, that any habit or practice that tends to shorten our lives is also a form of murder. That's where the health message comes in, that uh, you know, we, can, we can commit suicide by the way we eat and the way we drink. If we're not eating and drinking healthy food, we're killing ourselves and we can be violating the sixth commandment. And God wants us to be healthy. That's one reason why I like to sprout and grow microgreens. I want to get lots of nutrients in this body of mine, this 60-year-old body. If we've broken the sixth commandment, where do we go? We go to Jesus. We say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. And Jesus is more than willing to forgive us because he loves us. And he died for every one of our sins. Every single one of them he died for. There's not a sin you've ever committed that he hasn't died for. You know, the devil might tell you, you're too bad. You're too bad. I've been there. I've, I've had thoughts in my head that I was just so bad and so rotten that there's no way the Lord could love me. And I finally learned, don't listen to that GPS. Listen to the word of God. 
And the Lord brought me through my crisis by trusting him, trusting the Bible, and not listening to my own head. Praise the Lord. Commandment number seven. This is a big one. You shall not commit adultery. Read it in Patriarchs and Prophets. Read it in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, if a man looks at a woman and lusts in his heart, he's already committed adultery where? In his heart. So adultery is not just a man being unfaithful to his wife or a woman being unfaithful to her husband but it has to do with our thoughts. That if we allow our minds to think lustful thoughts, sensual thoughts, by watching things on TV or online, if we go to websites that we should never go to, then we're breaking the seventh commandment. God is looking for people to take a stand, to stand for moral purity, sexual purity, to wait until we get married, and then when we do get married, to remain faithful to our spouses. Are you willing to take a stand for the law of God? Sexual immorality is one of the things that are listed at the end of the Bible concerning those who don't go in to the New Jerusalem. The Lord has convicted me that sexual Immorality is a very, very serious issue. And he has spoken to my heart. I'm on the computer a lot, doing research and writing books, and God has convicted me. Do not go, do not click, even one click that's going to take you in the wrong direction. Don't do it. Don't click. And if you do click, if you have clicked, if you've done that, or if you've had sexual immorality in your mind, and if you've just thought, I don't know what to do about this. This is really strong temptation. Then where do we go? We've got to go to Jesus. He's the only place for us to go. That's why the law and the gospel have to come together. If we don't put them together, we're doomed. So we come to Jesus and we say, Lord, forgive me for all my sins. And you know what? He's, he wants to do it. He paid for all of our sins. And then I say, Lord, don't, don't just forgive me, but come inside my heart and clean up my mind. Clean up my mind. Make my mind clean and pure. And I've learned, and this is in my little book called Secrets of Inner Peace, that will be over the table, I've learned that the way to keep my mind pure is to fill my mind with the promises of the word of God so that when the devil tempts me, I hit him back with scripture. One time Seth was about four years old and I said, Seth, what did, uh, what did Jesus say when the devil said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread? What did Jesus say? And my little four-year-old said, Daddy, Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He was like a little preacher. And I thought, wow, praise the Lord. He's learning the, the Bible. And that's the secret of gaining victory. I could give a whole talk just on that, on the power of the word, the power of the promises. Once I met a guy in a a college student in the, in the uh, cafeteria of Andrews University. And uh, he started telling me his story. And he said, Steve, I've been an Adventist all my life. And he said, but just recently, I've been memorizing Bible verses. And he said, Steve, it's changing my life. Changing my life. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in what? The law. the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin 
against you. Jesus will forgive us for our sins, and his word can give us power to overcome the devil. Commandment number eight, you shall not steal. You know, that also applies to the IRS. Well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, to God what is God's. We need to be honest on our taxes. We need to be honest in our business dealings. We need to be honest in everything we do. God wants a people who take a stand for honesty, who are honest and true and straightforward in what they do. They don't cheat. They don't finagle. They don't overcharge. They don't steal. Commandment number nine says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, which basically means tell the truth. Jesus wants us to learn to tell the truth. And that's a hard thing to do. He doesn't want us to even exaggerate <laughs> about things. He wants us to be simple and straightforward and tell the truth. And the only way we can tell the truth is if we know the truth. And a lot of times we have to stop talking and, and learn enough in order to be able to speak the truth. Sometimes we're so quick to speak when we don't really know what we're talking about. It's like Peter who, who said something and then it says in the Bible he didn't even really know what he was saying. He just said it. God is trying to develop a people that speak the truth. The 144,000 have no guile in their mouths, no deception. They are without fault before the throne of God. They've learned to speak the truth. And if we haven't spoken the truth, where do we go? We go to Jesus. That's right. We say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive my sins and help me to tell the truth. And you know what? The good news of the gospel is that he died for every lie we've ever told. Every exaggeration we've ever told. Hallelujah. He already paid the price for that. His blood is enough. His blood is sufficient. His grace is enough for you and for me. There's not a one of us that's, that's gone too far that's down too low, that's committed too many sins. The devil told me that. He said, Steve, you've gone too far. You're down too low. And I learned at the bottom that the golden chain of mercy is long enough to reach down even to me. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> I've been through a lot in my, in my life, and I've learned lessons through my trials that are very valuable, that I can trust the Lord no matter what, and I'm not going to listen to the devil tell me that I'm unsavable, that I'm irredeemable, that God doesn't love me, that he can't save me, that the new Jerusalem is not a place that I can ever end up because I'm too bad. Don't believe that lie. It comes from the devil. Don't listen to those lies. Believe the Bible and the promises of God. Amen. Commandment number 10 is you shall not covet anything, your, your, your neighbor's wife or his animal or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, covetousness deals with the heart, doesn't it? The Sabbath deals with God's day, taking his name in vain, deals with our words about his name. Stealing deals with property, other people's property. Adultery, sexual immorality. False witness, our words. But covetous deals with our, our heart. Desiring things that other people have uh, beyond what is, what is normal. You know, if somebody uh, has a nice car, I might look at that and think, you know, that's a nice car. <laughs> Wouldn't mind if I had that car, but I'm not going to covet it. And because covetousness means we're not content with what we have. We're not content with the things that God has given us. And it's a heart issue. And in, in Patriarchs and Prophets, it says it reaches to the very root of all sin, which is the selfish desire. 
That's the root of all sin. And God wants to get that out. Now I can see my time is, uh, is almost gone. A little bit more. Let me, let me quiz you on this. What's the first commandment? God is number one. Number two? No idols. Number three? Don't take its name in vain. Number four? Keep the Sabbath holy. Remember the Sabbath. Number five? Honor your father and mother. Number six? Do not murder. Number seven? Don't commit adultery. Number eight? Do not steal. Number nine? Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Number ten? Don't covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. And then what the Bible does in the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, it, it summarizes the two tables. How do we summarize table number one? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And how do we summarize table number two? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's right. So the, so the whole law... The law of God that God is trying to develop a people to keep in these last days, to take a stand, to be part of the remnant, the law is summarized in love to God with everything we've got and to love our neighbor, which applies to anybody, black, white, brown, yellow, whatever the color of our skin, we're all brothers and sisters, and you are my neighbor, and I am to love you as if you were me. And that applies to uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and Ted Wilson and uh, anybody else's name I could mention. We should be praying for people if they're on the wrong track. Praying for people because we love them love to God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. The law of God is a law of love. You know, it's really interesting when you read the great controversy, there's one chapter in here called Facing Life's Record. It's a very powerful chapter. It's all about the judgment. It's all about the judgment. And when you read it, it's very convicting. About the day of judgment when the Ten Commandments try our lives and the principles of love to God and love to man. And it says right here in this chapter that no value is attached to a mere profession of faith in Christ. Only the love which is shown by works is counted genuine. Yet it is love alone which in the sight of heaven makes any act of value. Whatever is done from love however small it may appear in the estimation of men, is accepted and rewarded by God. If Paul said love is the fulfilling of the law, if the ultimate essence of the law is love for God and love for people, then God is looking for a people who have more love than anybody else in this world. They're the people that are going to give the loud cry. It's a people that really care, that really care for others, that really love others, and show that love in their lives. They love their enemies, they love their friends, they love leaders, they love the little people, the big people, the famous people, the unfamous people, they love everybody. And, and it's, it's that love that Jesus wants to develop in us so that we can be part of that final people in these last days who are his people, who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Got that? You know, there's a lot of uh, quote-unquote conservatives within our movement that talk a lot about law and obedience and overcoming, but there's not a lot of love in their lives. And then there are other people that don't ever talk about that at all. <laughs> We do need to talk about the law and obedience and overcoming, but we've got to put the love of Jesus in the middle of it. Amen. And the good news is that no matter what we've done to break all the commandments, we haven't loved God and we haven't loved others, 
the good news is that you know what? He first loved us. He loves us more than we'll have, that we have any idea. And on the cross, what happened was the finger, the finger that wrote the law was on a hand that was nailed to a cross. Praise God. That's the love of our God. And the love of God, the love of Jesus, is at the heart of our message. And his love and his forgiveness and his grace is enough for you. And you know, how is it that we become the commandment-keeping people that God wants who are able to love the world, that love the lost, that love our enemies, that love everybody? The only way that can happen is through a revelation of the love of God and a focus on his grace and what he did on the cross for you and for me. Got it? It's love that will produce commandment keepers at the end. Hallelujah. I'll tell you one story, and then I'll turn it back over to, to Marcus. Uh, years ago, I was uh, in Oklahoma. I was invited to speak at a camp meeting, and uh, my wife went with me, and little Seth, he was probably two years old at that time, maybe three. Abby hadn't been born yet. And so uh, one, one afternoon, I decided to take a walk, get out of the hotel and take a walk. And, and I took Seth with me. A lot of times I'd carry him on my shoulders, and sometimes he'd walk along. And as we walked along, uh, after a little while, we found ourselves in a, in a hot Oklahoma field. And as we were walking by this field, there happened to be a pile of rocks down there on the ground. And you know what little boys like to do with rocks? Throw them. So Seth, as a little guy, he just bent over and he grabbed this pretty good sized rock and he just threw it over his shoulders. And guess who was standing right behind him? <laughs> it was dad. And all of a sudden, this rock comes flying through the air, and it hit me right in the mouth. He's got a pretty strong arm. And, uh, oh, it hit me hard. And I was shocked. And the first thing I did was I, I, I went down. I went down, I bent down over, and I put my hands on my mouth to assess the damage. And the first thing I did was I touched my teeth. Oh, good, they're all there. So that's good. So then I thought, okay, this is not serious. And then I could feel the blood. My lip was getting fat, and my, the blood was coming down. And then my next thought was Seth. I thought, you know, I'm, a, I'm his father, and I love, I love my son more than words can say. And I want to try to teach him something. So I turned him around, and I had him look at me. And he looked, and he saw blood coming down off my, my mouth. And I said, Seth, Seth, I said, you hurt daddy. You just hurt daddy. And he looked at me and I said, say, I'm sorry, daddy. And immediately, without a beat, like a little robot, he was obedient. We taught our kids to be obedient. Honor your father and mother. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So I taught him. I said, Seth, say, I'm sorry, daddy. So immediately he said, I'm sorry, daddy. He just said it. And I knew that, well, you know, he didn't really, he, he probably didn't mean it, but he was obedient. So I thought, well, that's good. And then I belt back, knelt back down, and I started nursing my, my mouth, and he turned back around, and he started playing with the rocks again. <laughs> and then here's the most amazing thing that happened. After a few seconds, as I was nurturing my fattening lip, I looked over, and Seth then turned back around at me. He got away from the rocks, turned around and looked at me with a long look, a very intense look. And he looked and he saw the blood dripping down and then of his own free will, without me saying anything, he just looked at me and he said, I'm sorry, Daddy. 
I am sorry, Dad. And you know, that touched me so much. And my next thought was, praise God. My little boy has a conscience that the Holy Spirit is working upon, and he, he knew and he was sorry for what he did. And I'm going to close with this. You know, there's, there's a lot of ways that we can try to relate to God. And many times we just, you know, we say the words, we come to church, we sing the hymns, we pray the prayers, but it's not really in our hearts. Just like Seth, he was obedient. He said, I'm sorry, Daddy. But there's, a, there's another way to relate to God. And this is what God is looking for in these last days. Among his people who take a stand for him and his Ten Commandments and his cross and his love. And that is to get on our knees with a sincere heart when we look at the cross and realize what our sins have done to our God and to our Savior and to say, Abba, Father, I'm sorry because of what my sins did to Jesus on the cross. I ask that you'll forgive me by your grace, cleanse me from sin, come into my heart by the Holy Spirit and help me in, this, in these final days of earth's history, in these last days before the end of the world. Dear God, in, a, in an age of universal immorality and sin and wickedness everywhere, Dear God, help us to be the people that take a stand for the Ten Commandments and for Jesus in these last days. Amen. If we do that, we'll never be sorry. One of these days, the gates of the New Jerusalem will open and we'll go in and we'll eat from the tree of life and we'll get to be with God forever. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. It's the last verse of the Bible. And the last word of the Bible is Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, I guess that's it. Um, I don't have any famous last words. Uh, we're going to pray, and then I think we've got a table out there with some extra products. Anything else? them to know what was that he has a couple announcements okay let's uh let's close with prayer thank god and ask for his blessing upon us and our families and our mission to a lost and dying world dear god in heaven thank you for everything thank you for this weekend thank you for everybody that's been here and those that are or will watch online, we pray for the Holy Spirit to fill our lives, write your law in our hearts, help us to be your commandment keepers in these last days. Bless Apocalypse Ministries, bless White Horse Media, bless uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church, our leaders in Washington, D.C. and around the world, and all your people, whatever church they're in, that are trying to walk in the light and to get ready for Jesus to come. Bless us all, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.